views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. And hello, welcome to Open, the show that opens the Bronx and the rest of the world right to you. I'm your host, Darren Jaime, and today we're going to update you on what's happening in and around our borough. Coming up on today's show, you'll get the latest news in the world of politics. We recap what happened during election night last night, so please stay tuned. Afterwards, the Bronx is a borough that's known for salsa music and dance, and uh, we're going to tell you about a fundraiser event that explores the best of this. Then, We Belong Network, the digital media platform for veterans, will showcase the launch of its website, app, and web TV channel on Monday. And then a little bit later on, a food drive on two wheels that is part scavenger hunt and part bike ride. The requirements? Get food and do it on a bike. All you need is a bike, a bag, a lock, and some money to buy food. And then, Lehman College's 50 years of black studies in higher education. We're going to let you know a little bit more about what's happening with that. So stay tuned because all this and much more is heading your way. Right now, we're officially open. I'm Darren Jaime. Today is Wednesday, November 7th, 2018, and you're watching Open, a live program, bringing the Bronx and New York City straight to you. We also want to welcome our viewers on Manhattan Neighborhood Network, as Open is also being broadcast live simultaneously on MNN's channel. Now, you can stay connected to us to find out more about us on Twitter at BronxNet TV and on Facebook at Open BronxNet Television. Well, a lot has certainly been going on through this past week, and particularly last night with election night. We'll take you through it with some Bronx updates. Well, it is the morning after, and the results are in as America has voted. We'll recap the national results shortly, but here in our borough, two major stories. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Bronx-born and Westchester raised, was the youngest woman ever elected to Congress at the age of 28. She won the general election handily against Republican Anthony Pappas after upsetting established Democrat Joe Crowley in the primary race. She'll represent New York's 14th Congressional District, which covers the eastern Bronx and portions of northern Queens. A former campaign organizer for progressive presidential candidate Bernie Sanders, Ocasio-Cortez campaigned on a similarly progressive platform, including Medicare for all, a $15 minimum wage, federal legalization of marijuana, and abolishing ICE, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Office. Well, also big news, Democrat Alex, uh, Alessandra Biaggi won election to the New York State Senate on Tuesday. She called the victory over longtime Senator Jeff Klein, the former leader of the Independent Democratic Conference, better known as the IDC. Now, she led Klein with 72% of the 80% districts reporting, speaking to staff and supporters in an election watch event in the Bronx. Biagi pledged to pursue ethics reform in Albany and strengthen climate reproductive health protections. Now, Klein appeared on the ballot during yesterday's midterm election on the Independence Party line, also on the uh, ballot, I should say, were Republican Richard Ribostello and Conservative Party candidate Antonio Vitiello. Well, last night was a great win for Democrats as many went out to vote for the midterm elections. Our Bronx State cameras had the opportunity to witness it all, and we go back and take a look. Wow, 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 what a night! Four more years for Governor Cuomo, bringing his race against Mark Melinaro to a close yesterday evening. I am humbled by the support of New Yorkers. I'm gratified by their trust. I will work every day to vindicate, vindicate the confidence that the people of the state of New York have put in me. I am proud of what we've accomplished together, and together we're going to do even more. 
Other notable Democratic victories included Max Rose, who upset Dan Donovan in New York's 11th Congressional District. Letitia James secured the win for the New York State Attorney General's office, making her the first black woman elected to a statewide post. And from the Bronx, Alessandra Biaggi, who was elected to District 34 of the New York State Senate. There will be a nail in the IDC coffin, never to return again to the Democratic State Senate. It has been a, almost a year that we've been doing this, and I feel like we're at this point where we have touched so many voters and been able to talk to so many voters, and the work will only just begin. But before the work begins and the plans start to kind of unfold, I think we're going to have to rest because it's going to be a lot of work up in Albany, and I really want to make sure that I'm giving it everything that I possibly can. Karina Reyes was elected to the New York State Assembly's 87th District and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who in a landslide victory became the youngest woman ever elected to Congress. She took the seat for the U.S. House of Representatives 14th District. My biggest hope from today is that we aren't the last ones, we are the first ones. And that we hope that honestly we're just holding the door open so that many, many more can come because in order for us to turn this ship around, we all got to run and we all got to organize and that's ultimately what this is about. So I hope this is not just about this year, but in the years to come, we're going to see lots more new uh, you know, elected officials, new organizers, new activists, because that's what it's going to take to turn this country around. Keep watching BronxNet for all your up-to-date and local coverage in the world of politics. Reporting for BronxNet, Darissa White. And thank you, Darissa. We'll have more open. Stay with us. We'll come right back right after this. I guess sometimes things just happen. Devastating things. Your whole world changes in an instant. That's what happened to me the day my mother had a stroke. I'm Paul George, and I want you to spot a stroke fast. F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time to call 911. Protect the ones you love. Spot a stroke fast. For all the papas out there, let's stop what we're doing and take a moment. A moment to be with our kids. They can be loud moments. Goofy moments. Sporty moments. Dorky moments, kooky moments, moments where we talk or walk or just hang out. It doesn't really matter. They all count because every time dads take a moment to be with their kids, well, it's pretty momentous. So let's all take a moment to make a moment today. So I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello? That's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek. Behold the angry giant. Behold the angry giant. Behold, the angry giant! Behold, the angry giant! It only takes a moment to make a moment. Take time to be a dad today. Why don't you ever see elephants hiding in trees? Because they're really good at it. <laughs> Yeah, I get it. Well, Thomas, you've got pre-diabetes. But with more exercise and a change in diet, it can be reversed. I've tried exercising. It, it just makes me hungry for bacon. I love bacon, too. And who really likes to exercise? Not me. <laughs> me neither. Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so we're good? What? Oh, you still have pre-diabetes. Big time.
Dan, thank you for staying with us. Continuing our election coverage, the GOP is claiming victory this morning. This after many uh, maintaining control of the Senate. Democrats gained control of the House by flipping 26 seats to take the House of Representatives and six gubernatorial seats. Now, here locally in New York State, Democrats gained the majority in the New York State Senate, giving them control over the two branches of government and the governor's seat. Here now to talk results and what is next, we welcome now Michael Benjamin, associate editor of the editorial page of the New York Post. That up, uh, Mike, good to have you. Glad to be on. Glad to be on, Darren. Uh, you know, it's the some morning. night last night. I know it was a long night last night, and we all <laughs> and we all got a, a little bit of sleep, but we're back at it today. Uh, I'll start on the national front. Uh, for you, any surprises? I mean, we thought particularly that the Democrats had a great chance of winning the House. They did win the House, uh, but a little bit short on the Senate. Uh, were we predicting? Did you predict that? Well, most pollsters had predicted that the Democrats would take the House but probably uh, lose lose the Senate, and it turned out that they lost the Senate, and they lost an additional two seats. So uh, the Republicans have uh, will have a firmer control of the U.S. Senate, I believe 53 seats to the Democrats' 45. Yeah. And talk to me a little bit about this here, because we've got some gubernatorial states, and we've got Georgia that has not yet been conceded. Florida was a close race with uh, Andrew Grillam and Ron DeSantis. Ron DeSantis just, uh, just getting by there. Uh, can we talk about that blue wave for a moment? Because a lot of people were concerned uh, that yesterday was going to be this great blue wave. Uh, from your perspective, was it a wave or was it a ripple? Well, if you're standing in New York City or Philadelphia or any large uh, urban area that's Democratic, yeah, there was a blue wave. But if you're in uh, Utah or uh, North Dakota, there wasn't much of a, of a blue wave. Th those are solidly red states. Yes, turnout was up all across the nation. Uh, you know, record levels for uh, for mid for midterm elections. Thirty-five million early votes were cast across the United States. So voters are energized on both sides. Um, you know, the, the Democrats have the large cities and the large suburban areas um, as their strongholds, but it doesn't translate into the more rural, uh, less sparse, more sparsely populated states that are in uh, you know Republican hands. Um, you know, you saw just how close things were in Florida and how close things are in Georgia. You know, once you got to go outside the major urban areas and major urban counties, you know, Democrats uh, have, have trouble taking, taking control. And in, and in a number of congressional districts in New York that, that, that are flipping to Democrat, um, they're close. You know, it's, it's, it's 40, it's 50, 49, you know, uh, 49, 48. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's a very, very, very close, close margin. I mean, my paper, New York Post, said that the blue wave uh, was actually uh, a little more than a ripple. Yeah, uh, and I think that's what a lot of people characterize it on the morning after. Uh, let's talk about New York State for a moment. The uh, Democrats have gained control of the New York State Senate uh, with, uh, you've got the governor on the Democratic side. Talk to us about what can we expect coming out of Albany, given the fact that the Democrats have tilted uh, the seat of power. Well, the, 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 the New York is now a one-party state. The Democrats control the, the governor's mansion, uh, the attorney general's office, the state controller's office, uh, both houses of the legislature, the Senate, and the Assembly. And notably, the Assembly and the Senate are led by African Americans. An African American woman in the, in the Senate, Andrea Cousin, Cousin, Stuart Cousin from Westchester, and our own uh, Carl Hasty from the uh, from from the North Bronx the, is the speaker uh, of the Assembly. And so, when it comes time to negotiate the budget. You'll have two people of color in the room with the governor. No longer be three men in the room. It'll, it'll be uh, two African Americans and the governor, uh, you know, fighting for uh, New Yorkers. Right? And it'll be representative of, of urban, urban, urban New York through our, our speaker, um, suburban New York through Andrew Stewart Cousins and the governor representing uh, the, the whole state. And, uh, you know, for the first time, you'll have people of color at the table, you know, bargaining over the budget for New York State and trying to make things better for all New Yorkers. What the governor Cuomo's got to face now, like, He's facing a very uh, left of center a Senate, a very left of center assembly, and uh, there are things he may uh, they may vote on and seek to pass that he may not be uh, you know uh, really uh, comfortable with with doing and spending money on. For one, I think single payer health is going to be one that uh, I think both houses are going to want to pass, uh, but it's expensive, um, and the governor got to figure out uh, you know, what he's going to do to try to dampen some of that. Early on, I expect them to, to show they have control. I see the, I see them passing the Reproductive uh, Health Act to try to codify Roe v. Wade in the event the Supreme Court, uh, you know, weakens uh, 
that pressure when it comes to women's reproductive uh, choice. Um, maybe doing a couple of things. There are probably a lot of things around um, criminal justice reform, particularly I, I think they want to reform uh, or end uh, cash bail. I think both houses there are comfortable doing that. And given the snafus yesterday at the Board of Elections in New York City, I'm certain across the state, there'll be an effort to reform the state's election law. You know, try to take the pressures off Election Day by having um, early voting. Um, no excuse absentee voting and other ele election reforms. They think that will open up the process and make it a little easier for New Yorkers to register to vote and to exercise that vote. Yeah, and uh, for Attorney General Tish James, who's now elected, uh, a lot of concern would be her monitoring of what goes on in Albany, given the fact that you've got uh, Democrats in, you know, in, in, in all branches of government, including the governor's mm -hmm. office. Uh, partiality, fairness has always been a criticism. Where do we see this going? Well, that's not her job. You know, it's not in the attorney general's, uh, really in the attorney general's purview to go after corruption in Albany. Uh, yes, every 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 uh, four years, a newly elected uh, attorney general wants to expand uh, that power and do more law enforcement. Um, we'll see what, what happens, but I don't see the attorney general spending a lot of time going after uh, corruption uh, in Albany surrounding her, 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 her colleagues uh, in, in the Assembly Senate. And, and the governor's office. Now, she'll continue the uh, anti-corruption task force with the state controller who look at, you know, local, municipal, village, and town, and corruption within, you know, state workers, and then going after that sort of thing. They'll continue to do that. I really don't, don't see her mounting a special effort at public integrity by targeting um, the people in, in, in the legislature. Right. And, you know, I tweeted this morning that – I would tell my former colleagues in the Assembly and Senate and newcomers that, uh, you know, pretend that everybody is a confidential FBI informant. The sweet deal that's coming to you, mm -hmm. don't buy it, move on, keep yourself out of trouble. Wow. The good words from, uh, well, former Senator Michael Benjamin, uh, now with the New York Post. Mike, thank you so much for sharing with us. Uh, of course, we're going to break this down a little bit more, so we'll get you back uh, so that way we can get a little bit more insight a little bit later on. Thanks a lot, Mike Benjamin. All right, bye. All righty. Listen, guys, take a quick break. More show coming up. Stay with us. We got more open right after this. My name is Osvaldo Adames. I grew up in the Bronx and went to school right here at the Bronx School for Law, Government, and Justice. In the seventh grade, I hadn't given college that much thought. But all of that changed when I entered the Bronx Institute at Lehman College's Gear Up program. Gear Up helped simplify the entire college application process, helping me prepare for the SATs and organizing college visits and open houses. Last year, I graduated from Hamilton College in upstate New York with a major in mathematics and a minor in Mandarin Chinese. Now, I'm a teacher at my old middle school. I think back to seventh grade, and I honestly had no idea how much help Gear Up would be. They offered me the support I needed to succeed. If you're enrolled in Gear Up, talk to your academic coach or visit the Bronx Institute at www.thebronxinstitute.org for more information. And we are back here on Open. Well, PS212, the Multicultural Magnet School, is announcing a special partnership with the 42nd Precinct. Telling us a little bit more about it, we welcome now, actually, the school's principal, Ms. Fatima Ali. Good to have you. Thank you. Good to be here. Good. And many times when we talk about schools partnering with police, you know, sometimes we hear it on the negative side. But this is an opportunity for you guys to actually have a positive partnership. And uh, the 42nd Precinct is really coming together with you in the lives of students. Yes, that's correct. So tell us a little bit about the partnership. 
Um, so I spoke to um, Commanding Officer Ernest Morales III, and we talked about uh, ways that we could increase partnership with the school and the community. Um, and we thought it would be best if we started with our pre-K students. So pre-K is uh, a, a time when they're learning about members of the community. Um, so what better way than to have the community officers come in. So we have Officer Buck, Officer Matt, they're great. Um, and they come weekly and they read to our pre-K students. Um, and then from there, we started to, you know, build on that and we expanded to the upper grades. How was it walking in the door, having these officers come through the door and then sit down and reading? Because, you know, we know what the first perception is when sure. you see police come through the classroom. Uh, so give us about your students' reception. So coming from a place where I had DARE officers in my building when I was uh, in school, I wanted to immediately you know, close that gap. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we have police officers come in just to visit and say hello. Right. So that they, they, we change the, the mindset and the narrative that police officers are bad, but they're actually good. They're here to serve and protect. So we open up that conversation with students and students are comfortable to ask those questions. And when we talk about the students, obviously, uh, they've got a lot of positive feedback from this experience. Yeah. You've expanded it actually as well to do some more things. So talk a little bit about more that you've got going on between these offices. Yeah, no, they're great and their capacity is huge. So we went uh, and started talking to the older students who, you know, uh, experience, you know, normal life issues and, and want a forum to discuss them and ask questions to the police officers directly. Mm -hmm. So we give them that access and the police officers visit, you know, weekly as well um, to talk to the students about topics like bullying, um, about how to stand together and how to, um, if you see something, say something, and how, how that could potentially turn you into a hero. Um, so changing, again, the narrative about what it means to protect each other and, and build that community, mm -hmm. which is what we're looking to do. Um, and then in addition to that, they're also speaking with students individually if, mm -hmm. they, if students need someone to talk to, you know, as in a mentorship role. Right. I want to talk to you about your, uh, you know, in terms of attendance, you've got great attendance at your school. Um, and uh, I think student attendance is 95%, and, uh, you know, and when it comes to the city, it's 94%, so you're doing even better than the city average. Well, we're aiming for 100%. I, 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 how, do you get, how do you go about that? <laughs> well, we need programs, right? right. So we, we're getting support from the, the precinct as one, you know, um, and then we want to increase the arts. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to get some dance programs in the building, as we did last year. We had dancing classrooms. Um, we had a battery dance grant. Um, that was specifically for high schools, but they worked with us, with the middle school, and then with the elementary school. Mm -hmm. So trying to um, get some support so we can get the programs going that we know will enrich the experience. And how valuable is community partnership? I mean, obviously you've got this with the police department, which is tremendous, right? But talk to us about community partnership and what that actually means in the life of the students, as well as for your teachers. Um, so some students, you know, they connect through the arts. So some students connect through academics. So this year, for the first time, we're also a community school. So we have partnered with FIPS. Um, and so we have um, other CBOs that are coming in, like Sobro, um, like Community Change, and um, OmniLearn. So what that means is, for OmniLearn, that's supposed to bring hands-on science to the classroom to make science more engaging and more interesting for students so it's not textbook learning. Um, community change is coming in to help students build on their legacy, so connecting to their identities, celebrating that diversity, so that we actually are walking the talk of, you know, um, celebrating diversity and integrating tolerance right into our building, um, and thinking about what that looks like and what that feels like and how and where does that live. Um, and these are the partnerships that now we have uh, with these CBOs that could help support that vision. And so for people who don't know about your school, how would you describe your school? I think our school, from what I'm hearing uh, when people come in for the first time, is it's an inviting, warm sanctuary. So it's a, it's a good vibe place. It's a place where everyone wants to be. Um, and it's a safe space. So we've done a lot with um, transforming the physical environment. We've had a lot of support from facilities um, to create the, um, the vision. So the, 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 the walls, the, the paint, the, the smell, um, the pictures of the students, um, the furniture, the resources, the technology. We just got a $500,000 grant from Ruben um, Diaz, Bronx Borough President. So we're really grateful for that. Um, yeah, and just there's That's more awesome. to come. We're really exciting about excited about the transformation. Well, you got to come back and share a little bit more with us. Oh as yeah, time continues to go, and certainly, congratulations on the partnership with the police department, Thank all you. the great things that you got going on. Thank and, uh, you so much. Good to have you. Good to be here. Thank Alrighty. you. All righty, Miss Fatima Ali, she's the principal at. Uh,
let's get the school correctly, 212. And I uh, want you to make sure that you get connected to her. Uh, you got the Twitter handle, uh, 212XShine. And make sure you get connected with the school. Listen, taking a quick break. Got more open. Stay with us. We're coming right back right after this. Well, Thomas, you've got pre-diabetes. But with more exercise and a change in diet, it can be reversed. I've tried exercising. It, it just makes me hungry for bacon. I love bacon, too. And who really likes to exercise? Not me. <laughs> me neither. Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we're good? What? Oh, you still have pre-diabetes. Big time. Patriotism. It inspires passionate debate. It's worn like a badge of honor with good reason. Because it means love and devotion for one's country. But what really makes up this country of ours? It's the people. To love America is to love all Americans. This year, patriotism shouldn't just be about pride of country. It should be about love. Love beyond age, sexuality, disability, race, religion, and other labels. Because love has no labels. Now, you do know here in the Bronx, we are famous for a lot of things. We're known for a lot of things. We're called the Boogie Down, but also the Bronx is the borough of the salsa dance. And today, we're going to talk about a fundraiser, exploring this rhythm. Now, joining us here is program organizer Nando Alberici, mm -hmm. and good to have you here. And uh, yeah, we got something mm -hmm. special going on. Hey, thanks for having me, Darian. Yes, definitely. Um, I host the show, Con Sabor Latino on WBAI, right. listener sponsor WBAI. And uh, listener sponsor means that we get the funds from the listeners. That gives us the liberty to program what other stations do not program, um, similar to what BronxNet does. Right. So in order to raise funds, uh, I have uh, the privilege of having these world-class musicians perform free of charge on behalf of BAI. And this uh, makes for a great uh, event because they really want to play. Remember, they're not getting paid. Right. So they go in there because they want to play. They want to show the community that they want to give something back. So that's why we're doing the fundraiser. And the, fun, the fundraiser is uh, backed up by these five great bands, four iconic honorees, mm -hmm. and one noble cause. <laughs> and that's it, WBAI. This is going to take place at uh, SOBs. And if you haven't ever been there, it's uh, 204 Varick Street on the corner of Houston Street, right? That's right. The number one train, if you go and buy a train, puts you practically on the dance floor. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you, 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 you can get there. And so for people who uh, want to know who's performing, come on, let's talk about who's performing. First of all, I just wanted to kind of uh, um, just uh, follow up on what you said about sure. the Bronx being the county of salsa. Right. In Spanish, we say El Condado de la Salsa. And... A lot of these musicians, they may not be living in the Bronx, but they have been Bronx. through the Bronx right, before. Right. One of the honorees, the great Ray Santos, happens to live in the Bronx. He's the only living um, member of three great bands, the big three, mm -hmm. Tito Rodriguez, Tito Puente, and the great Machito. The bands that are actually performing are bands that are traveling the world over, and they reflect the programming that we do at BAI. For example, we have a combination of the traditional salsa sounds, but we also have, for example, Anthony Carrillo and Amy Quint Millan, a lady from Michigan on piano, musical director, a woman, mm -hmm. and they are appealing with their fusions, with their uh, combinations uh, to the younger crowd. So that programming reflects what we do on the program, and we want to, you know, we, we give a lot of attention to the pioneers, mm -hmm. but we also pay a lot of attention to the emerging groups because that's how we're going to keep the thing going, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. if, if, for your years, if being a radio host mm -hmm. and doing that, how has salsa transcended down through the years? Well, it's because the, the uh, basics of it are, are so well formed by these pioneers, man, mm -hmm. that it, 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 it serves as the foundation for every generation that wants to grow into bigger and better things. Mm -hmm. uh, you know that some of the best jazz musicians happen to be from the Latin music side. So you have a lot of these Latin musicians that play Afro-Cuban music being great in jazz as opposed to having a lot of uh, jazz musicians that cannot do the Latin music as well. So 
these musicians, um, the salsa has strength center because these musicians happen to be well-trained, well-schooled on the basic of uh, the uh, Son Montuno, mm -hmm. and that uh, each generation adds their own color to it, their own you know, ingredients to it, and keep it going up to another level. So that's how it transcends. Right? Mm -hmm. Nando Alberici is here with us. He's talking about mm -hmm. the great event that's taking place for uh, WBAI. It's going to be a benefit. It's taking place at SOBs uh, November 18th from 5 to 10 p.m. There you see the information uh, on the card. Uh, let me just say 3 to 9 p.m. 3 to 9. I'm sorry, what did I say? 3 to 9. All right. right. Mm -hmm. 3, 3 to 9 p.m. I think the possibly there was a... You know, the, the wrong time put yeah, on the F-Line. Fix it up. 3 to 9 p.m., bro. That's mm -hmm. it. But before we get out of here, please tell some people a little bit about WBAI. If nobody knows about BAI, I haven't tuned in at BAI. Here's your shameless plug. <laughs> <laughs> well, BAI, man, in a short, uh, uh, the short story is that BAI brings a rather unique approach to politics, uh, to uh, arts, uh, any issue. BAI has a unique approach to it, a unique delivery because we, once again, are supported by the listeners. So for example, when Exxon spilled all that oil in Valdez, Alaska, mm -hmm. we're not afraid to talk about Exxon because right. they're not gonna take an ad away from us. Right. So that's, that's the difference and we really appreciate the opportunity to uh, let the audience know. Uh, what BAI does and, and how we raise money. And when this is one of the ways. When you're a community, you can be a community voice, right? There you go. There you go. You're <laughs> not beholden to anybody, right? All right, right. That's right. All right, Nando, <laughs> Thank good you. to have you. <laughs> Best wishes for uh, November the 18th, as we said, 3 to 9. Want to make sure you get out there to SOBs. Have a great time. Support WBAI. We're going to take a quick break. I want you to come back. And when we come back, we're going to have more open. So stay with us. Come right back right after this. dumped by text is harsh try getting dumped by tennis ball my ex owner drove me out to the woods yelled fetch and by the time i bought the ball back he was gone yeah i was pissed but the folks at the shelter helped me let go of my anger i learned coping skills like taking it to the hole boom now i'm ready to fetch again but how about i throw and you run and get it I guess sometimes things just happen. Devastating things. Your whole world changes in an instant. That's what happened to me the day my mother had a stroke. I'm Paul George, and I want you to spot a stroke fast. F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time to call 911. Protect the ones you love. Spot a stroke fast. Maybe you can make retirement happen. After all, you made this vacation happen. Double points with every purchase. Cleverly merging promotions. Love it. Cross-referencing travel sites. And booking all your flights with those... Vouchers. I got us bumped. They were like, oh. But now they're like... <laughs> Aloha. You aced this vacation. Now get the tips you need to get on track at aceyourretirement.org. How can I help my daughter with her reading? Searching for help with Dachshund reading. No. <laughs> Let me try. Sarah's bright, but when she's reading, she has trouble sounding out words. Playing world music. What? I give up. Wait, I was trying to show you how Sarah feels every day. Frustrating, isn't it? Redirecting to understood.org. Join parents and experts at understood.org, a free online resource about learning and attention issues to help your child thrive. Well, I want you to set your calendars towards next week, because next week, the digital media platform for veterans are going to showcase their launch of its website, app, and web TV. And uh, joining us to tell us a little bit more about this, we welcome now Professor Susan Watson-Turner, and she's Director of Programming for Lehman College. 
Professor Mark Robinson, veteran and vice president of production, and Christine Danielle Davis, who's an actress, a writing, and a teaching artist. And uh, good to have you all. Thank, Thank you for having, having us. Time. We're Glad. really excited to be here. Well, excited to have you here, too. Yes. And this is something by veterans for veterans. So And their families and, their and friends. friends. Okay. Yes. So give us a little bit about how, how this all came about. Well, uh, it was very, you know, as artists, we get inspiration from the people around us and who we're talking to and I just happened to be in a room with a woman who was married to a Vietnam veteran and she told me a story about they were together since high school and he was drafted and she wanted to buy a ticket to go to Vietnam to visit him and she mm -hmm. didn't realize that she couldn't do that and I realized at that moment that there's so much we don't know about the veteran experience and what they go through when they're at war and what they bring home when they come. So Mark Robinson and um, several other veterans on the Lehman campus, plus some veterans from outside of Lehman, um, have all come together to present that picture. Mm -hmm. You know, we work with the Patton Project. They go into VA hospitals and make films about what veterans want us to know. Right. And, and many times we don't know what they don't want us to know, and sometimes we don't we're not that sensitive to it, so. Mm -hmm. And Mark, you're the vice president of production and programming, so what can we expect to see? Uh, a whole a range of uh, things. I think the um, kind of the misconception of veterans is that, you know, we aren't very uh, expressive in terms of art form. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, anything from comedy to music to, you know, short stories, short movies, short films, it's just being able to uh, uh, harness all of that and be able to, you know, show to the world that veterans can be creative. Mm -hmm. And Christine, talk about your involvement. Oh, good. So I'm, I play. <laughs> <laughs> so we belong to because we're producing a short film uh, called Rapid Deployment, and I had the lead role as Tina. Um, it's about a young woman who is now shipped off to war because her punk husband decided he didn't <laughs> want to go to Iraq and fight. So now I come back after having PST, PST and P. I'm sorry, PTSD. PTSD. Right, you, yeah. See, I'm. Yeah, it's still not yet. Right, 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 right. Through. Hello. Right. Um, so that's happening. And you, the movie shows her journey through having that and her coming back and not even recognizing her son, not even being able to recognizing her, and just having all those issues. And you see that in the film. And it, I'm just happy to be a part of this. They, I was well received, and then it's just, a, it's just a great environment to be in. And they were re very welcoming of me, and I'm happy to be a part of this project. And I hope it's well received by others. I hope I did a great job, and people are just just love it and happy <laughs> to tell the story. Well, you know, it, it, you're absolutely right because when you think about veterans, the arts isn't always the first thing that comes right. when you think about veterans. So, right. so talk about even that narrative because that narrative is so powerful in itself because veterans, the arts, and the support for the arts. Well, we realized that there were a lot of splintered organizations out there, like Theater of War. They do a wonderful look at the, uh, the Greek plays and how war actually impacted way back then. And then they, they used that as an exchange for contemporary veterans to have open discussions. There's another group called the, um, oh gosh, Exit 13. They're a dance company. So they didn't know about each other. And, and a lot of veterans don't know, like you said, we don't think about the creativity that's inside, you know. And we have a, a show that we produce called Conversations from the Inside, which brings out some of those feelings um, that veterans have. Mm -hmm. And we're taking a look right now. I think this is a little bit of a yes. oh, wow. rapid deployment. <laughs> you know, craziness. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so I'm not sure if the Is it running? Yep, mm -hmm. that's rapid deployment. Okay. But give us a little bit about, you know, just the thought of making this. I mean, uh, the concept of making this and, it, it, yeah. <laughs> well, well, transforming, in, you know, I don't really have any, I have one family member who is in the Army. She's actually active now. And to mm -hmm. get into that role, I, I questioned a lot of people, like, what is the experience there? Like, how would you feel if you happen to be deployed right after having a child? So getting those notes and then transforming myself into that character was pretty challenging for me, but I thought I did a great job. I did a great job. I got it. It was a great Marcia, experience. You got it. Yeah. <laughs> you got it. You got it. You got it. You got it. So it was, really, it was really fun, and I'm happy to tell this story, and the many stories too come because the story needs to be heard. Yeah. You know? And so we're talking about an app, we're talking about web TV, mm -hmm. and we're talking about a website. 
And so if people want to be able to check it out, of course, we put some information at the bottom of your screen. But if people want more information, what do they do to check it out? It's all here, right, to the website. Or come November 12th, 630, mm -hmm. Love Your Theater at Lehman College. We'll all be there. So you want to come out on the 12th, be sure that you check it out. Uh, the website, is, of course, is at the bottom of this banner here. <laughs> we throw it up at the bottom of the screen so that way you can have an opportunity to check it out. But thank you guys for coming to share. Um, once things get rolling even further, come on back again and we'll, we'll, we'll let our audience know more about the great work that you guys are doing. And it's great to see the veterans actually being supported in such a major way. Great. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you, Solomon. Thank you. All right, listen, take a quick break. We'll be back with more open after this during a commercial. I'm trying my acting audition right now. <laughs> <laughs> Behold the angry giant. Behold the angry giant. Behold the angry giant. Behold the angry giant. It only takes a moment to make a moment. Take time to be a dad today. neighbors and best friends. I love my sister. My heart, my heart is a sea race. race. Love, love is love. Our family is no less than any other family. And here's a question for you. Are you interested in a food drive? Well, I want to tell you, all you need is a bike, a bag, a lock, some money to buy some food, and then you can enjoy Bronx Cranksgiving. Now, if you don't know what Cranksgiving is, we want to introduce you now to Edmundo Martinez, who is the organizer. One of the organizers. One of the organizers. But you organize it right here in the borough, right? Yes, yes. There yes, it is. Yes. And uh, let's talk about this. This was something that went on in, the, in Manhattan. Still goes right? on, yes. Still goes on, but you said, I want to bring this here to the... Bronx, the boogie down. Yeah. Talk to us about it. Oh, uh, well, Cranksgiving started in 1999 in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. um, it's been going on. It's basically a way to connect the cycling community to those in need. So uh, a few years ago, I was giving the organizers a lot of grief about the Bronx being excluded, like in many aspects of, of New York City living. Mm -hmm. And we were able to, to bring it up to the Bronx. So I reached out to locals, local businesses, uh, local residents. It's been a major community effort. We all come together. We get uh, prizes for different participants, and we donate the food to Bronx Works, who then who works directly with the community, and we give them the food. So for homeless, children, seniors, whoever's in need, they get the food. And you guys get together and do a wonderful, wonderful job. And so uh, talk about these bike riders. You know, there's a lot of great work that you guys do. Um, of course, you're hanging, you have the social aspect, but now you really have this other social component, which is really taking on the needs of the community, especially at a time like the holidays. Exactly, and that's one of the main focuses that we want to do. We want to connect the two communities. Um, a lot of times they overlap, but sometimes you don't uh, experience other aspects of the community. So we try to include the businesses, the arts. Uh, we got people like uh, BX Art Factory. They're one of the sponsors, and they help us organize behind the scenes. Uh, we got Tread Bicycle, a, wash a bike shop in Washington Heights, uh, which a lot of cyclists tend to buy their bikes and stuff up there. They're actually going to be donating a bike to one of the participants uh, this Saturday. So it's basically a community effort. We all come together. So it's a fun day, but it also gets very competitive. Yeah. And so there's this food collection that goes on, right? So talk about the food collection. Well, it's a scavenger hunt. You right. come out that day, you don't know what food items you're buying, and you don't know what markets you're going to. 
you register, we give you that list. So that's where the scavenger ha aspect comes into play. You got to find those places, find those foods, and rush back in a lot of time. And all the food is collected, and we give it to Bronx Works. Wow. So how many people do you have coming out for this? Uh, in the years past, first year, we had an, uh, almost 50. Mm -hmm. Last year, we cracked about six, close to 70, 75. So we're hoping we could every year progress and grow bigger and bigger and bigger. So what is like the uh, the winning time? How how long does it take usually? Well, well, uh, we've had some really good professional cyclists <laughs> come out the last couple of years, and they finish within like forty five minutes. But uh, we're adding some twists and turns to it, so we're kind of leveling the playing field a little bit. Right. And at the same time, we're opening the prizes up to way more than just first place. Mm -hmm. uh, there'll be different levels of prizes and actually just random prizes. So we've been very fortunate to have businesses just donate their services, people who donate their talents and skills. Everything that's there is 100% free, donated. Gun Hill Tavern opens up their door for us. Mm -hmm. They're letting us uh, use their space. They're going to give away some prizes. So it's it's a true community effort. That's, that's fantastic. And so people who are riding on their bike have the opportunity to pick up some food, bring it back, Great little scavenger hunt. And uh, so bringing it to the Bronx, what's it like for you? I mean, obviously you said you saw it in New York City, uh, but you really had a passion to say, I want this here. Yeah, that, that started for me when I started cycling about seven, eight years ago as an adult. Mm -hmm. I rode back as a kid, picked it up as an adult, and I realized that a lot of the focus was for Manhattan and Brooklyn. And it became very frustrating, you know, and that uh, we were, again, once again, getting ignored. So there's been great work by people like Transportation Bronx Alternatives Committee, uh, where we fight for bike lanes, we fight for safer infrastructure for pedestrians and cyclists alike. So we started, I started organizing social, social just gathering rides where people hang out, we chill, we go to different businesses, we go to different parks, and that's just progressed more and more. And it's like, as others get involved, it becomes bigger, and, it's, and it eventually becomes bigger than you. Right. And it's bigger than cycling. Now it's big, basically the Bronx. It's all about the Bronx. All about the Bronx. And once you know Bronx Cranksgiving, uh, is taking place. You can still be a part of it. Uh, so give people date and time and how they can That's get That's this part. Saturday. Uh, we'll be at Gun Hill Tavern, 2515 Third Avenue, the tavern and not the brewery. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, 11 a.m. registration. The noon time is, uh, we start off at noon. Uh, the Instagram, the social media, the email, everything is Bronx Cranksgiving. It's pretty easy to find us. Uh, it's a great day on the bike. It's a way to have fun. You give back and uh, interact with other people in the community. There's some that you may not even know or we're also fellow cyclists. Right, and that's what I'm saying about the fellow cyclists. Give us a little bit about that, because when you talk about cyclers, so many here in New York City, right? Um, but it's an opportunity for you guys to actually meet and meet some new people. Absolutely, and most people don't realize that, especially in the Bronx, many people who cycle in the Bronx were cycling out of necessity, mm -hmm. whether it was lack of transportation or funds. Some people can't afford those right. monthly metro cars. So the bike is actually the cheapest and most convenient way to go about. And most times you will bypass those buses that are stuck in traffic or those train delays. So it's a way to really connect, uh, stay healthy, and you meet, you meet people from all walks of life. I've made friends who are now all over the world all because I rode a bike. Yeah, the, bike is, the bikes are, are it. It's I, a game changer. It is a game changer. <laughs> it is a game changer. I had a little road rage today. I had to tell a guy, stay in your lane. I'll stay in mine. But, you know, we work it out. So long as you communicate. That's it. Communicate. That's it. Bronx crazy. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank everyone. you. Thank you so much for being with us. Listen, got to take a quick break. We got more open, so don't go anywhere. We'll come right back in just a few seconds. One fifty over ninety. One eighty over one eleven. One sixty over one ten. I had a stroke. This is what high blood pressure looks like. You might not feel its symptoms, but the results from a stroke are far from invisible or silent. If you've come off your treatment plan, get back on it, or talk with your doctor to create an exercise, diet, and medication plan that works for you. Go to loweryourhbp.org. If I would have followed a treatment plan, I would not be in this situation. hiding in trees because they're really good at it. <laughs> yeah. 
Iya gini Lehman College is celebrating 50 years of black studies in higher education. And uh, it's going to be a very special celebration and a very special event. And uh, with us now and joining us in the studios, Mark Christian, who's a professor of the Department of African Studies at Lehman College, and Donna Lafare, who is a senior of Africana Studies at Lehman College. And uh, welcome and congratulations. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, just a couple of things there. It's 50 years of Lehman College. Right. Uh, uh, fi yeah, correct. Right. 50 years of Lehman College. Right. And it was so, it, it's a year of uh, many anniversaries. Mm -hmm. um, so it's the 50th year of Lehman College. The 50th year of Africana stroke black studies is actually 196, starts from 1969. Mm -hmm. So it'll be next year. Right. But black studies coming into the nation the, the United States in higher education is 50 years. It started at San Francisco State College in 1968, mm -hmm. led by Dr. Nathan Hare. Mm. Very interesting. And so when we talk about this, uh, as you said, it was just intro it, not introduced about 50 years ago, not long, but talk about the impact that it's making with students. It's having a f fantastic impact. I mean, they started, the, the, it started in the 1960s in order to connect the campus to the community and the community to the campus. And young students um, protested that there wasn't enough black education coming through their experience. So they fought for black studies. And in that 50 years, you can now get a bachelor's, a master's, or a PhD in the field. A lot of people don't know that. Mm -hmm. So um, it, we are, in a sense, uh, the repositories of, of knowledge, of right. African-centered African knowledge, if you like. The impact we've had is quite profound. We're having a, an event that can elaborate more tomorrow. We have a panel and I'll be moderating the panel. We have two faculty and we have two students, one who's graduated, um, and he comes out of Mount Vernon. Just to give you an example, mm -hmm. he comes out of Mount Vernon, and he's gone back into Mount Vernon, and he teaches at, at a school, and he has a decent salary, and he, he connects with our department, our college, and his community which is the essence of uh, black studies from, mm -hmm. from the 1960s. And let me bring Donna in right quick, yes. too, because she's going to be a part of this panel discussion tomorrow as well. Right. And uh, talk to us from a student perspective. What's it like for you being able to participate in black studies and the impact that it's making with you uh, educationally and career-wise? Um, I think it, the impact of black studies on myself as a student, it's, it's just a a way for me to extend my identity. Everybody has, has asked me, you know, um, why, why this subject or whatever the case. And I'm like, yeah, how can I ever be tired of learning about myself? And it, it provides a grounding that I don't think you would really be able to get anywhere else. The department I always des describe, and they kind of say I recruit because I'm always, to all of my friends who are here at Lehman, I'm like, you know, take a couple courses, come to the department because you really feel like you're walking into family. You feel like you're, you're, you're ended up where you're supposed to be. And going forward, it's, you need that grounding to go forward and catapult yourself to where you need to be. Right, right. And to, to, to piggyback off Donna, uh, the, the, all the students get transferable skills. It's not so much just the knowledge, but right. they get transferable skills, uh, growth in confidence, how to write, how to articulate ideas, how to use computers, how to synthesize knowledge. So doing a degree in, in black studies, or Africana studies as we call it today, is, is a way to, to propel yourself forward in society and be a confident member of your community and the institution you belong to. Yeah, I, I, you know? I, I can testify that I spent time in black studies. Had great. two great professors at a city, a city college. Great, uh, great. One is named Professor uh, Leonard Jeffries. Yes, he's very and, famous. Uh, yes, 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 very famous. And Professor William Smalls. William Smalls is and, also and, yeah, very so, famous. And, and they wanted to instill in us an understanding of culture, pride. Yes, yes. Right? And do you, do you walk away with that feeling of 
great culture, great pride. very much so, very much so. Um, I think that I think that me personally, I I walked in with with a sense of cultural pride, but um, just going through who I am, like with a fine tooth comb, with the help of all these great scholars and professors and people who've already done it, it's it's just been. It's I and to say it's rewarding is an understatement. Seriously, I, I want to say about the repository of our history. For example, it's Frederick Douglass is two hundred years old. Mm -hmm. he, he's not alive, but he's alive in us. He's alive in our history. You know right. what I'm re alluding to. Uh, du Bois is one hundred and fifty years old. He was born in eighteen sixty eight. Um, Nelson Mandela is a hundred years old. He was born in nineteen eighteen. Uh, it, 1968 is also the 50th anniversary of the uh, assassination of Martin Luther King. Now, that's just a short encapsulation of keeping hold of our history, Major knowing who people, we are. Right. Major people and our department, we should celebrate its connection to Lehman College and also the, the broader community. And Don Donna is a personification born in the Bronx, I'm born in Liverpool, England, of Jamaican British heritage, mm -hmm. but I'm part of the African diaspora. And my grandfather was a follower of Marcus Garvey and was actually worked with him in the movement. So the, the legacy is here on this table, and you've been uh, a student of black studies, right. and it does show in your confidence. Yeah, thank you. I feel all right. <laughs> I'm doing all right. <laughs> Love it, Theater. I want to let you know on Thursday, that's tomorrow from 1232, it's going to be a great panel discussion celebrating 50 years of uh, black studies, Africana studies, and it's something that we're seeing now in colleges yeah. more and more prevalent. Yes. I remember when, when I went to school, and I know I'm really dating myself, when I went to college, uh, that it was just a couple classes. Yes. And just a couple opportunities yes. to take it. Yes. But now, very much more prevalent in, Absolutely. in students' course uh, Absolutely. Options. Scholars with, with m many books have been uh, published under Black Studies. We have, the, like I said earlier, the bachelors, the masters, and the PhD are available to any student. So there's no excuse mm -hmm. to stay at the bachelor's level. Yes. You can go right through and become a PhD. I have a master's in Black Studies. Mm -hmm. I'm the second generation, you see. I don't look it, but you know. <laughs> the second generation, yeah, dude. <laughs> you look real good. Look yeah. real good. No, but thank tell you. the people, listen, you can do that. You can get a bachelor's, a master's, and even a PhD. Yes. Uh, but what you can do right away tomorrow is going to be this very special panel discussion talking about 50 years of black and Africana studies uh, taking place at the Lovinger Theater uh, from 1230 to 2 on the campus of Lehman College. Uh, the event sponsored by Lehman College, the City and Humanities Program of the Department of Africana Studies. Thank you so much, sir. Thank no. you very much. Thank you for coming in and, and, and hanging out with us. You get the last Thank word. What do you yes. want people to know when, when, when thinking about taking a class like this? Um, I think what people should know taking a class like this is just you're going to feel so at home. And especially now in current times, it's, it's very it's refreshing <laughs> as, as far as everything that's going on. And you're just going to feel like I have to continue. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you both great. for coming. Thank you very much. Glad to have you. Thank All righty. You. Well, I got to let you know we're at the end of the show today. Got to tell you, thank you to all of our guests for joining us. We had a lot of them, and you, the viewer, for tuning in. Now, if you missed any part of today's show, you can catch the Cablecast at 5 and 10 p.m. on Optimus Channel 67. If you have Verizon Files, that would be 33, or watch us anytime on the web at bronxnet.org. Again, a special shout-out to all those who are watching on MNN. Keep this channel wide open. We'll talk to you soon. Take care, and God bless.